Hey everyone, welcome to part 11 of this Dark Urge Tactician Mode guide for Baldur's Gate 3. This part is all about the Githyanki Crash. We're going to be getting lots of experience through combat here, and we're going to get the Blood of Lathander that's found underneath the Crash. Let's start by going forward and then climbing up the ladder on the left side. That will take us to this upper area. When we're up here, there are some things that we want, like this elegant chest. Unfortunately, they're being guarded by the Githyanki guards around here, so we're going to need to take them out. All we have to do is to get into a position where this guy can't see us, so we'll just kind of hide out over here. And then we'll get into position to start off the fight by using a sneak attack range. We're in a good position because all the other guards in this area are down below. So they're going to have to waste a turn to get up here before they can really do anything. Now the enemy that we attacked has a ranged weapon and he would be a big problem shooting arrows down at us if we were fighting on the ground floor. So it's definitely advantageous to be up higher so that you can take him out and now we have the high ground. Now I'm just going to move the Dark Urge over because he's invisible. Now let's move Astarian forward toward the ledge so that he can get a good vantage point on the enemies. We can use our sneak attack range with him to attack one of the enemies down below. One of them has a lot less health and armor than the other ones, that's the Ardent here. Let's go ahead and hit him, we'll also frighten him with the Bow of the Banshee, that's nice for us. And now I'm going to just get him out of view so that they can't attack him outright. Gale knows counter spell, but I'm not going to counter this one because he's just teaching himself how to jump higher. That doesn't really matter. I like to save the counter spells for when the enemy is actually trying to attack me and do damage. So the warrior came up. He's just going to be in position. The other one will misty step up to me. And now when he tries to use psychic rend, I can counter spell this so that I'm not taking any damage. Now it's going to be Lazelle's turn, so I'm just going to finish the job that Astarian started. I'm going to move her right over next to this Arden, who only has half of his health remaining, and then she'll use her two attacks to finish him off. There's only one more enemy on the ground floor who will use Misty Step to get up close to me, and he's going to use Shocking Grasp, which will do a little damage and prevent Lazelle from using an attack of opportunity when he runs away. For some reason, the recording didn't capture Gale's turn, but all I really did with him is I cast Hold Person on this warrior so that he couldn't move. Because the warrior isn't a threat to me right now, I'm going to focus on the other enemy and try to eliminate him as quickly as possible. We'll hit him with a sneak attack melee and then follow that up with another offhand melee attack to do some good damage. And then it's going to be Asarian's turn to keep up the fight. So I'm going to have him use one of his sneak attack melees to do some really good damage. And if you're lucky like me, you can get a critical hit and just kill him outright. All that's left is the warrior who is currently incapacitated in that hold person spell. Any melee attacks against someone with hold person will be automatic critical hits. So you can see just two attacks from Lazelle and that fight is over. Let's open up this elegant chest up here. We can grab a couple potions of healing and a potion of greater healing. And now we can just head back down this ladder and get down to the bottom floor. Also, be sure to loot the enemies in this area. I have no idea why I skipped that, but you want to grab all the stuff because there is a merchant up ahead and we can sell off all the stuff that we pick up. Well, across the hall from that ladder, there's going to be a door with a skill check of 15. So let's roll that one and then go inside. Straight ahead of you, there's going to be another elegant chest. This one had 40 gold in it for me. Let's go through the nearby opening and then down this little ramp here. And you'll see at the bottom, there's going to be a merchant. It's a Jacques near Jira. Let's talk to her. And then what we want to do is ultimately trade with her because she does have something that we want. She's got one item that we want to buy from her and one item that we're going to end up taking from her dead body. So one of the things that she has is this knife of the Undermountain King. This is the one that we will pick up from her body. And the other one that we actually want to buy is this hand crossbow plus one, because that's not something that you can loot from her. So let's go over to the barter menu. I'm going to select the hand crossbow plus one, and I'm also going to then sell off a bunch of things that I don't need. So I'm not going to show all of that, but just skip through it. There are a couple items that you don't want to sell. Specifically, the Icy Crystal, Icy Metal, and the Infernal Iron. 
You probably have a lot of rings and other valuables that you can sell off at this point that really don't do anything. So get rid of all that and then we will now have a hand crossbow plus one that we want to equip onto the Dark Urge. Let's go into our inventory and I'm going to select the main hand ranged weapon and I'm going to now put on the hand crossbow plus one that provides me with a little bit more damage. So when we do those sneak attack ranges, we're going to be even more powerful. Let's save the game because we're going to fight the enemies down in this bottom part. It might be a little bit difficult to get a sneak attack off on this merchant, but we definitely want to start the fight this way so that they will all be surprised and that way we get a free turn of damage. Also, our rogues that have the assassin subclass will get automatic critical hits against enemies that are surprised. So let's use a Saryan. We'll use a sneak attack melee to once again attack that merchant and do a really insane damage against her. We want to eliminate her first and then we're going to focus on the other guards down here. So we'll just use a little bite here. We'll regain some health if you need it from a Starian. And also the enemy is now suffering from the bloodless status. Knowing that I get automatic critical hits against the enemies that are surprised, I'll use a sneak attack melee to one shot one of the guards nearby. So he's out of the fight. Now that the Dark Urge is a monk, I get access to a couple extra attacks such as the Flurry of Blows or just a normal unarmed strike. I thought that that would work just as a normal bonus action, but unfortunately it missed. But that's not too big of a deal. I'm going to pass it over to Gale now. If you try to attack from too close a range with something like Ray of Frost, it's not going to work so well. You have a disadvantage on it. So let's just move a little bit further away. And now with our potent cantrip ability, we're able to cast Ray of Frost and do some really good damage with it, making it harder for the enemy to avoid. And that will take her out and get a 75 experience. And now there's only one warrior remaining. So let's just run over here, hit him with an offhand attack and then we'll be able to pass it on over to Lazelle, who's close enough that we can start to have her attack the enemy with melee weapons. So two attacks in, he'll take a lot of damage. Now that he's really low on health, I don't really feel like using a bonus action with Lazelle, so I'll pass on that, and then it's going to be Astarian's turn. I could either try to hit him with a main hand attack, or I could use a sneak attack melee. I'll try to do that, but unfortunately it comes up as a big miss. So I still wanted to get some damage in, and I went with a pommel strike after that, but that was also a miss, so Asarian was completely worthless this turn. Well, with a Dark Urge, I definitely don't want to miss, so what I'll do instead is try to move a little bit further away from the enemy. I'm actually going to go up on top of this little stack of boxes here, and then I'm able to shoot from up above. Now he does have the ready to parry status, so you can see that he doesn't take all the damage that he needs, and that leaves me with Gale. So let's just move him a little bit further away so that I can use Ray of Frost against him, and that will be enough to take him out. So I get through that fight without losing any health and without using any spell slots either. So a really good fight all in all. Let's talk to the corpse of the dead merchant. We can then uh, loot the things that we want, including that knife of the Undermountain King and the other items around here. So as I go on a looting spree, I'll explain what that Knife of the Undermountain King does. Number one, it makes it easier to roll a critical hit. Number two, if you roll a two or a less with your damage, you'll automatically re-roll it and take a higher number. So it's like a built-in savage attacker. And number three, you have an advantage when attacking enemies that are lightly or heavily obscured. In my opinion, it's better to keep on that short sword of first blood so you do more damage to enemies who are full on health. But certainly, if you have a longer fight, it's probably a good idea to have that knife of the Undermountain King so that you can do more damage in a prolonged fight. Let's head on up here and then there's going to be a couple enemies up top. So let's use a sneak attack melee to start off the fight. And then something very strange happened. After the little cutscene that played out, the Dark Urge just decided to murder the raider. You can see I didn't tell him to attack. The enemy didn't have initiative. It's almost like the act of standing up made that attack of opportunity happen for some reason. So I'll take it. You know, it's not a bad thing at all. And then I'm going to switch over to Astarian. I can use a sneak attack ranged so that he can start off the fight here. Unfortunately, the enemy parried most of the damage with that ready to parry ability. But I do have a follow-up sneak attack range that I can use to do some more good damage against him. 
And now I'll switch it back over to the Dark Urge. I could bring in Lazelle and just have her attack or Gale, but I'm going to use a normal range attack and that will automatically follow up with the offhand range and that will be enough to eliminate that enemy, getting us some more experience. Let's go through, loot all these bodies as well. The Warrior Ken has a lot of camp supplies that we can grab, as well as the Githyanki Greatsword. And there's also going to be a chest over here that we can open up for some more poisons and a potion of greater healing. Let's go over here, grab the Crossbow of Arcane Force and the Neogi Claws. And now we can head on back the way that we came, going down by where that merchant was and we're going to keep our killing spree going by running over toward the north side and we're going to go out this door and then there's going to be a hallway that will take us over toward the right side let's run all the way to the end of the hallway where this raider is standing guard we're going to hide right behind them and then we can use a sneak attack melee attack they have 41 health and i did 50 damage with that one attack so that was definitely a one hit kill Let's loot the body, grabbing everything that we need, and then when that's done, I will be encumbered. When I went into the menu, I tried to remove the encumbrance by transferring some items around to other party members, but I got spotted by one of the guards here, and now I'm in a fight. When I was lining up a sneak attack range, then that enemy saw a Starion and brought him into the fight, so that interrupted me a little bit. Let's go over to the Dark Urge, we'll use that sneak attack range, and that will do about half of her health in damage. There are other enemies that will be patrolling around, and if they get close enough, they will join the fight too. Let's switch it over to Astarian, and he will use a sneak attack ranged against this raider that we started the battle against, and that will take her out. Now all we have left is that warrior who joined the fight. I don't want to run forward because that would just allow them to be able to attack me. So I'll just walk out of his line of sight, and then he will spend his turn buffing his jump ability, and will jump all the way over right next to my party members. So now I just have to have Lazelle attack. He does have the ready to parry buff, so I'll get rid of that with the first attack, and then the second attack will do a good chunk of damage to him. And we're going to then pass it on over to Gale, who will use Ray of Frost and hit him with that, just doing a little bit more damage while saving a spell slot. Now I can run up and I'm going to use my offhand melee attack just to do some more damage against him. And then finally, I'll move back over to the Dark Urge, having him use the sneak attack ranged to finish off the fight. All right, there you go. There's three more enemies that were eliminated in this hallway, and we're going to loot the bodies once again. Make sure that if you're encumbered, you just go into your inventory and move all the heavy things, like all these great swords that we're getting, over to Lazel so that she has them. Her strength makes her able to carry pretty much everything, no problem. Let's keep heading toward the west now. There's going to be a hallway here with a couple of youths that are talking. We're just going to start off by hitting them with a sneak attack melee, and that's going to finish off one of them, and then we just have to finish off the other one on the next turn. Now, Astarian gets to attack because it's his turn. I could either switch it over to the Dark Urge, and I probably would be strong enough just to hit him with one sneak attack melee to finish him off. But just to be sure that I get the kill, I'm going to have a Sarian attack first and then have the Dark Urge actually finish off the fight, turning us invisible. Now, if you're fast, you can run down here into the left and you'll be able to attack this enemy here. You've got to do it within 12 seconds in order to stay invisible and have that advantage. It's not a big deal if you miss it, though. You're still able to take him out really with no problems. And then we're going to keep going toward the west through the infirmary. There's a lot of enemies around this area. We're not going to fight them just yet we'll take them out later instead we're going to go through this oak door and into the back room now once we get everyone inside we're going to close the door because we don't want the enemies out there to see the sinister things that we're about to do let's switch control over to lazelle so that she will be the one to initiate this conversation this conversation isn't very important, so you can just skip through it. On the first dialogue option, we'll choose the first option, and then when we get to the second choice, we'll also choose the first option. When you get to the third choice, we're going to switch it up and say, Githyanki, I've waited long for this. It will be worth it. 
I'm going to follow the doctor around toward the Zathisk, but I'm not going to initiate this with Lazel. Instead, I'm going to switch it over to the Dark Urge so that he will be the one to interact with the Zathisk first. The device is strange, made of taut flesh. The Zathisk, Vlacket's purity distilled. My duty, my right. We want to be the one to do it, not her. So we'll say, stand back, I'm going first. She's not going to be very happy about that, but if you have a good reputation with her, you're actually able to convince her by saying, you would still be hunting for this place without my guidance. I will be cured first. And then she'll actually approve of that and allow you to go first. A beguiling turn of events. Go on, into the Zathisk. I will follow. Now we start a little cutscene. The doctor was expecting Lazel to go in, but you can say, I'm infected too. And then you're going to have to choose to lie down in the device to get going. And this will initiate a series of three different skill checks that are somewhat difficult to do. So I would recommend saving the game as you go through them because we definitely want to pass all three of them. That will give us a permanent buff, allowing us to cast Elithid Powers as both actions or as a bonus action. That's really nice if you want to use Elithid Powers. So let's get started. could be permanently damaged. Your skull groans and bends under the pressure. Then, agony. Let's use the saving throw to follow the doctor's instruction and seek the tadpole. Here's the first skill check looking for a 12. It is a little bit difficult, so I would recommend saving the game before this, and that way if it goes wrong, you can just reload it. You can use your inspiration points if you need to, to get through this, but there's a lot of checks coming up and we don't want to burn through all of those, so it might be worthwhile just to save it and then reload it if you need to. Let's keep going until we get to the second saving throw to stay calm and guide the device closer. This has a skill check of 15. Things are getting intense and the dream visitor will try to stop us, but we want to keep going. Use any of the saving throws you want to. I'm going to go with the one that's a monk. And when I choose that, I do have a skill check of 18 that I need to pass. So this one's very difficult. Use whatever bonuses you have available to you. Save the game and reload it if you have to, if you fail. And that's going to complete this section. Getting through all three of these skill checks is very important for us. You don't want to fail them. There's a chance the parasite lives. She wants it. We have one more skill check to do. We'll say deception. You're wrong. The parasite's dead. I felt it die. This will have a skill check of 15. You want to succeed in this one too, because if you don't succeed, she's going to run off and get some guards and make our life a lot worse. But if you succeed, then she will actually stick around in this room, allowing us to do what we want to do here. Incredible. I am disappointed. In any case, you're... So after all that, then she's going to still stay in the room just right where she is. Let's talk to Lazel now. She's going to be upset about this whole situation, but ultimately she's glad that, you know, I didn't die and that she didn't die. And she suspects that there must be a traitor somewhere around here. Now we're going to eliminate this doctor. We can just hide right behind her and then use a sneak attack melee to do some good damage against her. So we took off approximately half of her health, and then we have our turns just to eliminate her. It's a very easy fight using the tactics that we normally use. So let's finish her off, and then we'll be able to move on from here. Time to kill. 
All right, after the fight, let's loot her body. She's got some interesting things, including a new amulet for us called the Aberration Hunter's Amulet. It gives a Githyanki wearing the amulet an advantage on intelligence saving throws, and Aberrations also have a disadvantage on attack rolls against them. An Aberration is a specific enemy type, and it includes things like Mind Flayers, so it could be handy to put on Lazel and use with her. Let's search the table over on the right side for the Mind Flayer Parasite specimen, then go to the other side of the room and there's going to be two more Mind Flayer specimens on this table. So if you want to keep using your Illithid powers, definitely a good idea to grab these things. Okay, that is going to be it for the doctor's office. Let's go over to the door but not open it just yet. We'll save the game because we're going to take out all the enemies in the next room and it can be fairly difficult. We're going to separate the Dark Urge from everyone else and then run through the door, closing it once again so that the enemies cannot see our party members. Let's run over toward the other side of the room. There should be an area where you can be without the enemy seeing us, and now we can use a sneak attack range to attack the youth here, and then we should be able to take them out in just one or two attacks. Hopefully you get good initiative rolls. It doesn't always work out in your favor, but you probably will be definitely near the top, if not at the top, every single time. Well, killing an enemy, as you know, turns us invisible, allowing us to run around without being seen. The enemy is going to kind of freak out in this area. You can see there's quite a few enemies, and they're going to be running around, wasting their misty steps, doing all kinds of things, trying to find out where we are but they're not going to see us, so then that will end the combat. And all we have to do is to keep on going through this pattern. You've seen it before in the past video where you're able to keep going into combat using those sneak attack ranges while you're invisible. If that's not enough damage to kill them outright in one shot, then because we have the assassin subclass, we're able to do it again the very next time. So let's just eliminate this enemy. We're going to run away from our ghostly image on the ground so that they can't detect our presence. And that's really all there is to the vast majority of the sequence. It's just going to be attacking enemies with one or two sneak attack ranges while we've got that invisibility. And that is what we have to do. So I'm just going to let this play out without really explaining it. When we get to the end, there is one enemy that has a lot more health. And we actually will be using our other party members at that point point so just always make sure that you're using that sneak attack range to start off the fight and keep the pattern going from here Here's the enemy with a lot more health than the other ones. We're able to initiate combat against him, and because he does not count as a guard, we don't get that little cutscene at the beginning, then the enemy is surprised, giving us an automatic critical hit. This is just like when we fought the merchant a little while ago, where attacking the right enemy to initiate combat will make everyone surprised. If you attack the wrong enemy, then you don't get that surprised effect. So that enemy has now been eliminated. There's only two more weaker ones that we have to take out. I'm not going to waste my turns going through and turning invisible anymore. All I'm going to do is to go forward while I'm invisible and then I can use my sneak attack range to take out this enemy, the youth over here. So that one is now severely damaged. I can follow that up with a normal offhand range attack to eliminate this enemy. And then there's just one enemy left who's back inside the barracks area. Let's run away from our ghostly image so that the enemy doesn't know where we are. They're going to run toward that image on the ground, so they have no idea where we're standing. We can hit them with a sneak attack range. It's going to do some good damage, but not enough to kill them outright. So what I'll do instead is just switch on over to Astarian. He can come out here while hiding, and that lets us get into a good position where we can eliminate this enemy with another sneak attack, and then that fight will be over. So you can get through this whole area eliminating all of these guys without taking a single point of damage if you just do it the right way which in my opinion would be the sneaky way 
All right, let's get the whole party back together, and then we're going to make sure that we're not sneaking around anymore. There's no reason to do that. And then I'm going to switch control over to Lazelle because she has all the strength that we need to pick up all of the heavy weapons from the enemies around here. Let's head on back into the barracks area. There's going to be an elegant chest that we can loot to grab some more gold. And then there's some other items in this back room too. Another elegant chest that has some gold, some thieves tools, and an arrow of ice. So grab all that stuff and then we can head out into the main room here, looting all the bodies. This tougher enemy has the infirmary key as well as the ring of elemental infusion. Now there's going to be a traveler's chest. Do not open that up, otherwise an enemy will pop out and surprise you. Instead, just start wailing on it and then you want to break it open. That will allow you to initiate the fight normally. Thanks to our good initiative rolls, we should be able to attack this enemy first. It does have mirror images, making it a little bit harder to hit. And then we can just move on to our next character, the Dark Urge. We'll just have him use the sneak attack ranged, and that should definitely be enough to finish off this weaker enemy. So with that done, you can go ahead and loot its body if you want to, to grab a ruby ring. And it also has the Grimishka tail if you want to pick that up too. Back to Lazelle, let's run around and loot the bodies, grabbing all the heavy stuff that we want to, as well as the other camp supplies. And then it will finish up by heading out the door, and we're going to head back kind of the way that we came. Now, if you get to this point here at the intersection and keep going forward, kind of toward the north and then over toward the west, you get into the hatchery. There's really no reason that we need to go over there, so I will skip that portion. And then I want to head over to the north end of this room. There's going to be a lot of enemies in the training room that we're going to eliminate, but once again, we're going to do it the sneaky way. So let's head over here. We're going to park all of our party members out of sight, and then I'm going to have them hide and then switch over to the Dark Urge and separate him from the other party members. Now let's go up to that training room and we're going to start picking off the weaker enemies. There's a lot of weaker ones and one stronger one in there. So let's get close and then we're going to use a sneak attack range to attack this youth over here. Now strangely it did not initiate combat, nothing happened, I didn't turn invisible either. But the guys down there start murdering each other and then one of them does his best Aladdin impression by riding a magic carpet to the other side of the room. And I'm just going to hide out back here and then take out another one of these enemies nearby. And while I do get the kill, I rolled a critical fail on a stealth check, so I have to actually be in combat now. What I'm going to do is move forward a little bit. I'm not quite in range of this other youth, so let's just run a little bit forward and then hit them with a sneak attack range. And thanks to the Morning Lord's Radiance buff, I get just enough damage to take that one out. And now I'm invisible, I can run over to the side. The stronger enemy can use mental instruction to give a really big buff to those other weaker enemies. And then he's going to run around and try to find out where I am. But of course he has no idea. So that will actually end the combat and he's going to start walking away. Now I just have to wait a few seconds until the sneak attack range comes back online and then I can hit him as he's walking away and that will restart combat. He's not going to be too happy but we got one sneak attack range off on him and now I can use another one against him as well. I'm not going to do anything more with the Dark Urge at this point, so I'm going to now switch it over to Astarian, and he's going to bring the party up right outside of where they can see. I've got the perfect shot here where I can thread the needle right between these two pillars, and I can hit him with a sneak attack range, and then because I initiated combat this way, I can hit him with another one. And then through the power of teamwork, I can have Lazelle come in after that, and then she can use her range attacks to actually finish this enemy off.
All right, that enemy's gone, but it's not Lizelle's turn. She got a very low initiative roll, so I can't do anything more with her. Let's skip it back over to the Dark Urge. And as you can see, I am now perfectly aligned right where the enemy cannot see me. So that pillar is coming in clutch for me. I'm going to use my cutting action hide as my bonus action just to hide out where they can't see me. And then I'm going to use a star in it to close the door. And now they really don't know where I am. So I'm just going to hide out back here. This Ardent is going to run from the back of the room toward the front. He's not able to do a whole lot though because he can't see anyone. And then the other two guys are going to dash forward and through the door but because they dashed they can't take any actions while they're right next to me Lazelle still has her extra action from that turn so let's attack this enemy and then that's going to do some good damage against them that's all that I can really do for now so we're gonna go back to the dark urge this is the beginning of the second round of combat we're going to use a sneak attack range against the enemy that's already a little bit damaged and that will just hurt him a little bit more and then i'm going to follow that up with an offhand range attack to do some more damage and that will finish off that enemy i'm now invisible and i'll just run away from where the enemy thinks that i am it's going to be Asarian's turn again, so I'll have him use a sneak attack melee attack, and that will be enough to actually break the mental instructions so that they don't get those extra hit points anymore. Amazingly, Gale remained hidden this entire time, so I'll manually switch over to him and use a level 1 magic missile to do lots of damage to this enemy. I'll take him from 26 health all the way down to 10. There's not much else that I can really do with the Starion, so I'm just going to move him out of the way. I'll look at where the enemy is looking and just move him over out of sight, and that will be enough to end his turn. Now the Ardent's going to run forward and try to use Crown of Madness, but I'll have Gale shut him down using Counterspell, and that means that Ardent really doesn't get to do anything this turn. Because I left that other youth alive, he does attack and does 7 damage to Astarian. Not too bad at all. I can just have Lazel come in and finish him off, and then that's the end of that enemy. Let's run forward a little bit. I can't get close enough to actually attack the Ardent with a melee weapon, but I can go over here and then use a range attack just to do some decent damage against this Ardent. And then it's going to be the Dark Urge's turn. So we're going to move him forward and use a sneak attack melee to end this fight. So there you go. We got through all those enemies, gained a lot of experience, and we only lost 7 health from Astarian. I'd say that that's a pretty good trade-off. We're going to switch it over to Lazel. She's going to run around and loot all the bodies in this area. And then when you're done, we can keep going. When the looting is done, we'll go back out into the hallway, turning toward the left, that's toward the east. We'll go down by this waypoint and then turn left and follow the path around until you get to the door. When you open it up, there's going to be a cutscene that will start to play. There's nothing you need to do, so let's just skip through it really quickly. Please, Chitrai, the late, they all, we could. Quiet, fine. Yes, you heard. Do it for now. After the cutscene, then everyone is going to leave the room except for a couple key people, so let them all run past you. There's no reason to engage them in combat now. And then we ultimately want to go into the captain's quarters, but I'm going to do it the sneaky way. So let's hold all of our other party members back out in the hallway, and then I'll switch it over to the Dark Urge, and he's going to go in solo for right now. Make sure you save the game, though, because this is kind of a tough fight, and it can go wrong pretty easily. So once you're all saved up, let's go ahead use that short rest so that everyone feels their best and then we'll go over toward the north end of the room there's going to be an ardent over here let's just sneak around behind them and then we can use our sneak attack melee to do some good damage against them to fight. With that fight initiated, you know what to do. We're just going to use another sneak attack melee to finish them off, and then we'll be able to run away from our ghostly image on the ground, and no one will know that we're there. So there are a couple of these giant wolf dogs. They're going to run around and try to see where we are, but they can't detect us, and that's going to end the combat. All right, combat ends there. We're not gonna be too hasty though, so we're going to let the enemy kind of reset their positions. They all look over toward the right side of the room. They're looking toward the south, and that means that all of our party members can come up together and get right behind the Kithrak. So let's get into position here, and then if you want to save the game at this point again, just so that you're nice and secure, 
Let's hide, and then we're going to use a sneak attack melee to start off the fight. The Kithrak is pretty tough and has a lot of health, so we want to eliminate that as quickly as possible. The best way to do that is to have Asarian use his Valor Luve Shriek, that way we're doing extra damage against her whenever we attack. And then I'm going to also have him use his Vampire Bite so that the enemy will have the Bloodless debuff and that will hurt her as well. Now back over to the Dark Urge, I can just have him follow up with another sneak attack melee. Unfortunately, the Kithrak does have the ready to parry ability, so I'm not going to do a whole lot of damage with this one, but at least it's better than nothing. Thinking back on it, I should have used my offhand attack to break that ready to parry and then follow that up with the sneak attack, but it doesn't really matter. The enemy is going to run forward now and attack and absolutely destroy Astarian. He is down, but he's not out yet. And what's nice is that that Failure Luve is still working even when he's on the ground. So I'm able to still rack up lots of damage even while he's not currently in the fight. Using Lazel, I'll hit a couple times, then use Action Surge to annihilate the Kithrak. So she's out of the fight, and then I can start attacking those wolves. This wolf wasn't quite close enough to attack Gale. He had to dash in, which is convenient for me. And then I'm going to use a level 1 magic missile to finish off the other wolf. And now I'm close enough with Gale that I can just use a uh, offhand melee attack to attack this wolf and I'll do some bonus damage to him as well. By just using a sneak attack ranged or by just using my normal range attacks, I could very easily kill this enemy, but I'm not going to do that just yet. Instead, I'm going to pick Asarian up off the ground. So he's no longer at risk of dying, and now I can use my offhand range attack to do a ton of damage to this enemy thanks to all of the bonuses that I've got going on. And now it's going to be Asarian's turn, I'll just skip that with him and then have Lazel finish the fight. Now let's loot the Kithrak's body. There's two things that we really need. Pick up the Gith Shard as well as the Soulbreaker Greatsword. This is a new amazing weapon for Lazel. It gives us a huge boost to our damage as well as giving us a plus two bonus to our initiative rolls. So definitely want to equip that to Lazel. Let's keep going around the room. We can loot everything as we go. Honestly, though, there's not a lot that you really need to grab. I would recommend, though, running down to the body of this Ardent, and you can loot that one. There's going to be a scroll of mirror images and another Githyanki short sword that you can grab. Now, against the wall here, there's a Githyanki barrier disruptor. Whoever has the Gith shard that we looted from the Kithrak, use them to put the Gith shard into that Githyanki barrier disruptor. That's going to have a little cutscene here, and then we can just skip past all of this and then go through the door. So now we're going to continue along down the path and we're going to get down to the end where there's going to be quite a large fight ahead of us in the room beyond. At the intersection, turn toward the right so you're heading straight north, and we're going to go all the way to the end, but don't open that door just yet. We're going to prepare ourselves for this fight. So starting off, one thing that you want to do is to use your short rest. That way you get your Failure Aluve's ability back, and you also get your action surge with Lazel. I'm then going to make sure that everyone is fully healthy. I know that Astarian is pretty hurt right now, so I'm going to just use a couple of the potions that I've been collecting just to make sure that he is fully healthy, and then we are all set. Let's switch control over to the Dark Urge so that we're controlling him, and then we're going to save the game just in case something in this next fight goes wrong. Once the game is saved, we're going to have everyone sneak, and then we're going to go over toward the left side by this burning lamp, and then separate the Dark Urge from everyone else. If you do that properly, everyone is going to remain out of view from the enemy here. And now we're going to open up by using a sneak attack range on the warrior to the left side of the entrance. We should have a good shot against him, and then we can use another sneak attack range to hit him while they're also surprised. That gives us a big critical hit, and then we can follow that up with another offhand range, and that should be enough to take them out. Let's close the door so the enemy cannot see our teammates, and then we're going to run away from where they believe me to be, and that's going to end my turn here. 
we're actually going to let the turn pass by and then we're going to have the enemy come over here try to inspect us not be able to see where we are and that's going to end the fight so with that done, we're going to run further toward the side here, wait until our sneak attack range comes back, and then we're going to attack the other raider over here. And that's going to hurt him, maybe even kill him outright like that. We don't want to be right where we were, so let's move out of the way, just in case the enemy comes back and tries to find where we are. Now the Chirai is going to run over toward us. He can't quite get close enough to inspect, but that's okay. There's going to be the Ardent who can use Misty Step to get up closer, wasting their abilities and not being able to find anything. So that's going to once again end this fight. And then we're going to have control of our character again. The Ardent's going to walk away. We'll wait until that sneak attack comes back online and then we want to attack them down below. Unfortunately, my invisibility wore off at just the right time, so they spotted me, but that's okay. I can still use my sneak attack range from up high with this advantage, and that will be enough to kill them, turning me invisible once again. If not, then just use your offhand range attack to finish that, and then you'll be invisible and can hide again. The other Arden's going to run over here and try to figure out where we are. The Chirai still doesn't have any idea what we're doing. Now with our next turn, we're still invisible, so we have that advantage with a sneak attack, range attack. Let's go ahead, use that, finish off the other Ardent, and that will reapply our invisibility. We're going to run over toward the middle of this area, getting far away from where the enemy believes we are. And the Chirai will probably try to use something like Astral Step to get close to where he believes you to be but he won't be able to find you and that will end the fight once again. And then all we have to do is kind of let this all reset. He's going to go back toward the bottom section here. I know that the invisibility will wear off soon, so I'm just going to hide outside of his range of view and just kind of chill over here for a little bit. So now I can kind of get into position here while still hiding. I can use a sneak attack ranged. He's ready to parry. He's you know not going to take a whole lot of damage from this, but that does initiate the fight. And I can use another sneak attack range to do some good damage against him. Now, before I end my turn, I'm going to leave myself just like this and then switch it over to a Starion who's going to be outside the room. We'll sneak forward with everyone else and we're going to get right up behind him because we want to be in melee range of him. So sneak all the way down and then when we get right next to him, we're going to initiate combat. We're going to use another one of our sneak attack melees against him and that will do some good damage and that will bring us into the fight. Now, thanks to my assassin subclass, I'm able to attack again with a normal action, but I'm not going to actually attack. I'm going to use the Failure Luve Shriek so that I can do some bonus damage. Now, if I were to do this again, I would have him immediately use his Vampire Bite just to give him the Bloodless debuff early, but that's okay. I'll get around to that. I'm going to have Lazel come forward, and she's going to start attacking and do some damage to him. Unfortunately, she got a bad initiative roll, so she's got to wait for a minute. We're going to now have Gale start off the fight by having a Magic Missile level 3 coming at him. With that Failure Aluve active, it's going to do an absolute ton of damage, going from 81 all the way down to 37. So he did quite a bit of damage with just that one attack. Now with a Dark Urge, I'll have him just use his offhand range attack to do a little bit more damage. And now it's going to be Asarian's turn. I'm going to actually use that Vampire Bite that I should have used in the beginning. And as you'll see, I've gotten him all the way from 145 health down to just a measly 11 health in one turn of combat. If I had gotten that Vampire Bite in earlier, then I probably could have killed him in just this one turn. So he's going to attack a couple times, but it won't really be anything that we need to worry about. He just does a little damage to Astarian. And then I'm going to have Lazel attack him just at a distance. She still has her bonus action from before. If I really wanted to, I could have just used Action Surge and finished him off with Lazel here. Or I maybe could have gotten Gale to use Misty Step over and hit him with an offhand. But it doesn't really matter. I don't want to waste those resources. So I'll just let the turn expire and have the Dark Urge finish him with a main hand attack. Inquisitor Wawalgas was potent. We are impressed. 
Thanks, Flacketh. We now have a cutscene with a couple of very important dialogue options. So let's go through this. First off, we're going to choose to kneel. We're going to basically do exactly what Lazelle wants. Otherwise, she's going to be very angry with us and she'll actually attack us and we'll lose her forever. So make sure that you kneel initially and then we're going to get to the next dialogue option and say, I didn't take the weapon from you, but I am returning it. An unexpected servant. Everyone's still happy with us. Let's keep going through the conversation and then we'll get another very important choice. When asked to go into the astral prism to kill the dream visitor, we'll just say, I will do as you wish. Okay, let's skip ahead and then we're going to get to the end of this cutscene. Then all we have to do is to go forward and we're going to regroup our party members so that we're all together once again. And after that, we're going to head into the Astral Prism by using the plane caster right ahead of us. I skipped over a little bit of cutscene stuff because it didn't matter, and now we're going to be in the astral plane. Let's jump over the big gap and then we can run forward. Make sure that you're controlling your main character, the Dark Urge, and then we're going to uh, use the Beckoning Cave to get us in, and we can follow the voice in. This brings us to a lengthy cutscene where we will have about four different dialogue options to go through. I'm going to choose the first option in every sequence. So the first one is, Vlacketh told me you are an agent of the Illithid Grand Design. <laughs> I told you I stole the artifact from someone. Well, I stole it from Vlacketh. The Dream Visitor will have a lot to say, so you can either listen to it or skip through it all. Eventually, she's going to offer her sword to us and let us kill her if we think that that's the right thing to do. But we're going to say, get up, you won't die today. We get some more dialogue from the Dream Visitor, and then we get another choice. Let's go with the first option once again. The Dream Visitor has a lot more to say, so let's skip through this, and then the last option that we have, we'll just say, let her try. The Dream Visitor will encourage us to continue on our path toward Moonrise Towers, that's into Act 2, and then we get into a cutscene with Lazelle automatically. We're going to say option 3, actually, I learned a few things, your queen is lying to you. Lazelle doesn't really believe us, and she's going to demand that we let her see what happened, so we're going to open our mind and let Lazelle into our memories. Your thoughts become one. She sees the truth of your confrontation in an instant. All right, and that will do it for that conversation. Now, before we leave and go through the portal, there are some things that we can grab along the way. You can loot the dead Githyanki around here. There's a potion of superior healing. You can also run down toward the bottom part here. There's another Githyanki. Doesn't have that much interesting. And if you go up top here, there's going to be another one that you can loot. This one has the scroll of eye bite. Let's continue along toward the west, and you'll get to the end of the path. Then you can jump over the big chasm here up to the other side, and there's going to be a nice chest over here. This is a gilded chest that holds a lot of gold and some other good things for us, including an elixir of heroism, which is a very nice elixir. Let's jump down, and then we're going to go all the way to the end where we can interact with the portal, and that will take us back to the other world, and we'll be right back where we were before, inside the room where we fought the Chirai. It's a good thing we took out the Chirai and the other Githyanki before going into the Astral Prism, otherwise they would ambush us when we come out, and we'd be surrounded, and it would be a very difficult battle, so always make sure that you eliminate them first. Now we talk to Lazelle, we just have to say, you're an enemy of your people now, you need to accept that. Silence. I must think. We're now in the Inquisitor's Chamber. We've got no more fights to do for the rest of this video, but we do have a lot of looting and things to grab. So open up the chest nearby and you can grab this strange conduit ring. And then we're going to run over toward the west. There's going to be a room filled with things that we can grab. Let's open up the chest on the left. We're going to get some arrows and some more gold. And then ahead of us, there's going to be a heavy chest with lots of good potions. There's a gilded chest here for some different scrolls that we can grab. And then most importantly, there's going to be two statues on the side. With Lazelle, we're going to interact with the statue on our right, which is the north side of the room, and we're going to use it three times so it spins and basically faces the camera. 
Then we're going to go to the other side and we're going to attack it with a main hand attack that will loosen it up. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to turn it. So that moved it one time and now we're going to move it two more times for a total of three that will make it face the opposite direction away from the camera. And then it will open up a door in the back allowing us to go through. Let's run all the way toward the west side and there's going to be a door down below that we have to go through. And this will take us down to where we collect the blood of Lathander legendary weapon. Just for coming down here, we get 180 experience, which is good for us. Let's go back to the Dark Urge, and now we're just going to use our normal range attacks to attack the energy source, these bluish glowing crystals up on the wall. Once we destroy that, it will remove the barrier. Let's go forward, and then straight ahead of us, there's going to be a Dawnbreaker. This is a trap that we want to disarm. It has a skill check of 14. Let's roll that one, and then when we succeed, that will disarm the trap. Now we'll turn and we'll go around to the side. There's some ledges that we want to go around and then it will hop over this little gap here and there will be another one of the energy sources on the wall that we can destroy and that will eliminate the other barrier that was ahead of us that we went around. After the energy source is destroyed, let's go forward, this time as a Starion. There's another one of those Dawnbreaker traps just to the left, so let's disarm that with another skill check of 14, and then we're going to switch back on over to the Dark Urge. We'll run forward, and then we can see on the ledge on the other side of this room, there's going to be another energy source down below. Sometimes you can hit it from up top, but sometimes it's easier just to go down the ledge and then get a good shot at it from down here so we're going to attack it a few times to destroy it and then climb back up to the top of the ledge if you can't make it work just jump up that works too and then we're going to run all the way toward the west and we're going to go up these stairs and at the top is where you'll find the container for the blood of lathander Let's go forward and then using the crest panel, we're going to insert the Dawnmaster's crest that we got from the Rosymorn Monastery in the last part. So let's insert that Dawnmaster's crest and then there's a little cut scene that you can get where you will get the Blood of Lathander. The Blood of Lathander isn't the most powerful weapon in the game, but the extra abilities that it has makes it very useful in Act 2, so we will definitely want to have that one equipped when we get to that point. Well, we're done here for now. Let's just keep going out toward the east. We're just going to run down this hallway. We deactivated all of the traps and all of the barriers, so it's just a straight shot all the way back toward the east, and we're going to go back through the door and taking us back into the Inquisitor's Chamber. Okay, we're not quite done looting this area yet, so we're going to keep going east all the way up the stairs, and then we can go right over those little boxes that are barricading the door. We can just climb over those, and then keep going, and we're going to go all the way across this room, and we're going to keep going east because there's another side room that we want to loot over here. So once we're over here, there's a couple chests that we want to open. There's a gilded chest right here that we can grab a couple nice elixirs in. And then there's going to be an opulent chest that has some more goodies for us. There's the skin burster that's a unique halberd right against the wall. And then a couple more chests along the side wall here. This is a rustic chest with some alchemy ingredients. And then there's going to be another heavy chest against the wall that has some valuables that you can just sell. Let's keep going out into the room and we're going to start looting these bodies. So this one has some camping supplies as well as the Diadem of Arcane Synergy. When you inflict a condition, gain Arcane Synergy for two turns. Arcane Synergy adds your spell casting modifier to your weapon attacks. So on some builds that can be very useful, but on a wizard not so much because we don't really use weapon attacks. Let's loot the Chirai's body to get some interesting items, and then we're going to keep on going. Remember that if you're worried about going over on your weight limit for your encumbrance, just switch over to Lazelle. She can carry all this stuff without an issue. Well, let's grab the last little bit of stuff in this room, and then we're going to head out toward the south. We're going to leave the room and go all the way down that hallway, and we're going to run all the way back to where the waypoint is. Now, I would highly recommend that you do not leave the Githyanki crash on foot. You do not want to go out either the main entrance or the side entrance by where that merchant was that we killed before and got the knife of the Undermountain King. So instead, we're just going to run over 
forward to where the waypoint is, and that will be a safe point where we can then fast travel out of here. There's a very particular reason why we don't want to go out, because that triggers something that allows Voss to come to us at night, and we don't want to do that just yet. Instead, what we're going to do is now fast travel over to the Salunite outpost in the Underdark, and that's going to allow us to enter a different region without triggering the cutscene where Voss comes to us at night. So let's just skip ahead until when we actually get to the Underdark. You'll notice that traveling to a different region refills all of your health, but it doesn't count as a long rest, so we still have the Morning Lord's Radiance. Let's keep going from the waypoint straight toward the west, and we're going to go out this window here, and then over toward the right side, where we can see some knotted roots that go down. We're going to use them to climb down below, and then run over toward the south, but be prepared because you're going to get surprised by an enemy up ahead. So run forward, you'll be surprised, and then there's going to be a cutscene that ensues. I'll just let this one play out because I've never showed it before, and it's kind of interesting. We get surprised by a spectator, which is a pretty strong enemy. It will start off by unpetrifying at least one of the other enemies around here, and then it's gonna start attacking everyone else. It can use different rays from the eyes on its tentacles. It can attack you with its mouth. It has a lot of options, and then all of the other enemies that it unpetrifies will also try to attack us. Being blinded is a little bit unfortunate, but it's a lot better than taking damage. It's now the beginning of the second turn of combat, and we're able to act now because we're no longer surprised, and I'm going to take out the spectator in just this one turn. Let's run forward with the Starion and then use the Shriek ability to make sure that we're doing extra damage against him. And then we're going to have Lazelle move forward and start to attack with all of her melee attacks, as well as using Action Surge to get some more damage. Every time Lazelle attacks, we're doing normal damage, psychic damage, lightning damage, and radiant damage thanks to all the buffs that we've got going on. So you can see every attack does huge amounts of damage and now it's down to half health. Unfortunately she missed that last attack that would have been nice to hit but it won't really matter in the long run. You can't make range attacks while you're blinded in that cloud so we have to move out slightly so that we can hit it with a seek attack ranged with the dark urge and that does another huge chunk of damage to it and we can follow that up with our offhand range attack just for a little bit more damage. The spectator will unpetrify another enemy and then try to run away but Lazelle gets the attack of opportunity hitting it once again. It's going to go around and keep attacking Lazelle, and then eventually try to fly away. Now it's Gale's turn to act. We're going to move him forward, and we have to jump over as much of this cloud as possible because we can't hit him from way back here. If we run through the cloud, our movement speed is really reduced, so we're going to jump to get past as much of it as possible, and then run until we're just outside of the cloud. Now let's use a magic missile. We only need a level one here, and that's going to be enough to finish him off, and then we'll start a cutscene automatically. I offer to parlay, and he brings a spectator. Twit, quite ruined my ambush. Now, you are? I'm the Dark Urge. You're welcome for the rescue. Rescue? Helpless babes are rescued. I allowed you to assist me. I am Dawn, third son of House Bartol, first rank evoker, and initiate of Graven Hollows. Oh. Oh, no, no, my dear Dark Gods below, no! A memory shard, a container onto which brief mental impressions are projected and stored for years at a time. It's fading. It seems you've been frozen like that for a while. Far, far longer than I realized. Then my enemies have already found the forge. 
Which bastard stole my glory? Zagrim? Philro? Philro went mad. I had to kill him. Consider it mercy, or pest control. Philro was never fully right. We were friends once. Three of us working together to find a lost wonder. Until the others grew jealous, began to guard their secrets. You can really say anything you want to at this point. I'm going to go deception, nothing. This does come with a skill check of 10, so let's roll this one and then keep on going. Disappointing. But he's out of the way, so small blessings, I suppose. Well, I have some business I am long overdue in completing. And I'm sure you have something to do. If you try to get the crystal from him now, he'll turn hostile against you, and we don't want that. We want to initiate the fight. So instead, we're just going to bank the 240 experience for that conversation and then run around to the top. Beware of the torch stalk mushroom that will blow up and cause some damage if you're too close to it. But what you want to do instead is just to loot the spectator to grab the spectator eyes amulet. Time to take out the other enemies around here. We'll start and initiate the combat. The number of enemies that you have to fight here is dependent on how many enemies the spectator unpetrified before you killed him. So in this case, there were two enemies that became unpetrified, so I'll have to eliminate both of those before we can move on. I'm just going to finish off the Isway up here, and then we're going to move on and attack Dorn, who's down below. He's the one that we were speaking to just a moment ago. So I'll hit him with my offhand range attack, and then I'm going to move over to Astarian. I'll have him use his sneak attack range, and that will finish off the fight. And now we can just go around and loot the bodies over here. So Isway, he had the Arrow of Roaring Thunder and some other equipment that we don't really need. Let's head down and we're going to loot Doran's body. He's got some good stuff, including that memory shard that we talked about, as well as the icy helve. That's something that we need to craft a new weapon for Gale if we have all three parts, which at this point we do. He's also got the blast pendant that allows us to use the class action lightning blast. So now what we want to do is to craft that weapon for Gale. Let's go into our inventory and we're going to go and make sure that we have the Icy Crystal, the Icy Helve, and the Icy Metal. Those are all three things that we've collected so far. And then we're going to combine those three items together to create a new weapon. So once we have all of those selected, then we're going to choose to combine them and we're going to get the Morning Frost weapon. This is a staff that is good for people using ice magic. It has the Heart of Ice ability. When dealing cold damage, the wielder deals an additional one cold damage, as well as Insidious Cold. Dealing cold damage with a spell possibly inflicts Chilled upon the target. Chilled makes an enemy vulnerable to cold damage, and if the enemy is wet, then they'll actually be frozen for one turn and won't be able to do anything. When we looted the spectator, we grabbed the spectator eyes, allowing us to cast Ray of Fear and Wounding Ray. Those are two attacks that it used against us. For the last part of this video, we're going to travel over to the Grim Forge. So let's just fast travel directly there, and that will do it for part 11. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give me a like and let me know down in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe if you want to see the rest of this Dark Urge Tactician Mode guide. I'll see you very soon for part 12. Until then, thanks for watching and have a good day.